The Grazadillo School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University proudly presents the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. This podcast invites top business practitioners and thought leaders to share their view on the real world of business. So as I was thinking about that, and you were talking about your 40-year career here in Silicon Valley and doing some interesting things, and really a wide variety of responsibilities in, in, at HP and then in Agilent. And so you have seen this area, and you've seen the world of technology change just dramatically through that time. As you look to the future uh, of that, I don't know how much you think about what's going to happen in the future, where do you see kind of this area and that industry going given where it came from 40 years ago? I mean, what are you excited about? What concerns do you have that are out there that could affect what's going on here? Okay, well, <clears throat> a really good question. Um, one of the things that, um, that I often note that when I started in the Valley, most of the companies and most of the jobs here were aerospace defense. Lockheed, Philco, lots of, you know, uh, ITEL, McCullough, even Varian, Watkins, Johnson, lots of companies, aerospace defense. This was in the mid-60s. But then when the, um, the semiconductor came along and, and uh, you started seeing uh, the, the Fairchild and then the spinoff from Fairchild and all the semiconductors start, companies start, um, that's when the valley started to really become Silicon Valley. But once you had semiconductors, then you could start building computers that didn't fill a room half this size or this size. Uh, you could actually build computers that were smaller and, and, um, and, and uh, could fit on desktops and others. So that, I think, really gave rise to the computer business when you could start using semi semiconductor chips, um, integrated circuits. Uh, to build uh, computers and other devices. Once you had the computers, then you needed to build software, then you needed to have the networking, and then uh, you know all the other peripheral things came along. And then in the 90s, of course, we had the internet. So, uh, so if you look at the valley, the valley has evolved. Mm -hmm. You know, from aerospace defense to semiconductors to computers to networking to software to now the internet. And so I have complete confidence there will be a next thing. You know, there always is, mm -hmm. and they all layer on top. These other things don't go away. They just kind of mature, and something else gets added on top. And so, you know, a lot of people speculate, what is that? What's that going to be? Well, I don't know. It might be green tech. It might be biotech. It might be, um, you know, maybe there's something we haven't thought about yet in broadband, you know, with broadband communications and you know, uh, all, the, all the information that's going to be available in, in video and data. Um, but I, I have a lot of confidence that there will be, um, there will be a lot of great ideas uh, for, for this valley to pursue. My only caveat is whether we're going to have the resources to pursue them. I worry about our education system. Right. I worry about our, our, uh, our, um, some of our limitations on immigration. I think those could be serious when you look at you know what has provided the stimulus for growth in sure. the past. These things have been critical. So, so given the fact that we can have a supportive infrastructure in California, and given the fact that we can find the resources to uh, to uh, start all these young companies and and grow the business, uh, I, I'm sure there will be a next thing. And you know, probably some combination of green tech and, and biotech would be my guess. So you mentioned the importance of things like immigration and education to the future. It certainly applies here, but it applies all around the country as well. So this is sort of a very different kind of question to, to build on that. Those are very important public policy issues. Yeah. And I think some would say that business has sort of shirked its responsibility in taking seriously public policy issues and in trying to have an influence in ways that would be helpful for the future. And I know we talked a little bit earlier about you have, you know, mm -hmm. those are things that are important when you think about. What role does business have, uh, not only in doing its job as a business, but in helping shape and form public policy? Well, I think it's, it, it should be a fairly big role. I, I think, unfortunately, um, thanks to Enron and WorldCom mm -hmm. and all these things, and now the financial problems the last couple of years, business is way down in the totem pole in people's good guy list, and, mm -hmm. and I think business uh, credibility is, is not what it needs to be. 
And I think part of, part of the issue is we haven't build, built a very good case. At the end of the day, um, uh, we all want jobs. We all want better education. We all want you know, a positive uh, economic uh, future for our country. Um, but that's going to take some investment. That's going to take a supportive environment for business. And uh, I think business hasn't laid out probably the, the macro case, and it's been hard because of all these, right. all these uh, scandals and other things. Uh, and then we have to go in to look at specific policy areas. There are groups, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, the American Electronics Association. There is a lot of work going on in education and, mm -hmm. and, um, and in uh, immigration and other things. But unfortunately, right now, people aren't listening. They're, mm -hmm. There, there's other things uh, kind of on the agenda, right. and business doesn't speak with the same credible voice uh, that it probably had at one point in time. When Dave Packard used to speak uh, about the needs of business uh, 30 people years ago, listened. people listened. They listened. We don't have that today. One of the other things that, you're, that I mentioned briefly in your introduction, and I'll sort of use this as my last question, so be thinking about what you'd like to ask. I just want you to see a little bit about the areas of interest and things he's working on if you want to ask more. You're on the Packard Foundation board. Uh, talk a little bit about what that foundation does and and why that's so important to you personally, but also why the Packards felt like that was something they needed to do far beyond uh, creating a, a company that's done what it has. Well, I, I think the role of foundations in our society is probably not really appreciated very broadly. Um, you know, Dave Packard, Bill Hewlett, Gordon Moore from Intel, you know, there are so many great foundations. Pierre Omidyar now at, at eBay, Jeff Skoll. Um, you know, there's so many great foundations out there that are really trying to do good things. For me personally, it's kind of closing the circle. I kind of feel that I got a lot of opportunities in life because I was lucky and joined uh -huh. HP. And I had to, you know, was a, there at the right time and, and was fortunate to, to benefit from the success of the company. Um, and so when, um, when Dave, pa before Dave Packard uh, died, actually about 15 years before he died, he set up a foundation for, for the family to run to do good for society with some of the money for, he made from, from HP. So for me personally to be on the board and help the family makes me feel really good that I'm helping them and giving back to thank them for some of the things that, that the company did for me. But the Packard Foundation is very broad. They have three ongoing programs. They give a lot of money still to the Children's Hospital. There's a new campaign to expand that now. So we're giving a, a quite a bit of money to that. We have uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium was started with Packard Foundation uh, money, but that became so successful, they spun off a separate research arm called Monterey Bay Research Institution. That is one of the top now, um, uh, top oceanographic research organizations in the world. And we still give them 30 million or more a year. So it's a, that's, that's a big uh, commitment. And then we sponsor, then we have a fellowship program where we take top scientists from around the country and we give them grants to do research so they don't have to spend all their time looking for money. They can just go do their research. And that's been hugely successful. And, Many of these fellows have gone on to win Nobel Prizes and other things. It's been a very, very great program. So those are ongoing program. Um, and then on top of that, the Packard Foundation invests in three major areas, conservation and science. Um, and that includes everything from buying land to um, working on things like sustainable seafood so, uh, so we don't take all the fish out of the ocean and don't have any left. Uh, we, um, we have a program in, in uh, children's health and families, which is primarily focused around preschool and, and after school, as well as health care for children. And then we have a program for uh, population. It's interesting, Dave Packard in the mid-'80s figured out that many of the underdeveloped countries in the world had no hope of being uh, uh, economically prosperous unless they reined in their population problems. So he started very early on family planning, uh, reproductive health, women's rights, a whole bunch of issues in underdeveloped countries in the world, and we still give a fair amount of money for that. So anyway, those are the major areas, and uh, it's, it's, it, it's been great to see. And uh, again, that's just one foundation. Hewlett does a lot of good things, more foundations. So you add up all these foundations, Rockefeller, Ford, 
Carnegie. I huge mean, it's, impact it's in this huge country. Huge impact, mm -hmm. and I don't think people really understand what a difference. And yeah. I mean, now Bill Gates, of course, Bill is giving a massive amount of money for HIV, AIDS, and other infectious mm -hmm. diseases, and uh, uh, you know, it's having a huge impact. In fact, we're working with him on some of our programs in Africa on, on family planning and reproductive right. rights because it's linked to the HIV problem. So, um, so anyway, it, it's a great organization, and they do good work. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. I wanted folks to see what kind of a broad influence you're having in the work that you're doing, as well as, as the resources that came out of uh, Hewlett Packard's success. So I want to open the floor to see what questions you guys have. So we'll start here, and then I'll go right over there. Uh, we have a microphone, so Paul, start right here. Yes. Front. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask you a question regarding what executives do after retiring. In your case, they go to philanthropy, foundations, uh, there's the people from SCORE who do a lot of things. We have seen a new phenomenon in the Valley, executive after retiring going to politics. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that won't be me. I don't <laughs> so I would like in, a, your, in a high profile kind of way. In high profile. Say, yes. <laughs> and very close, by the way. So I would like your comments about that and if you see this as a blip or as a trend in, since you have been in this environment, what are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, I think any executive that's been um, going flat out for, you know, 20, 30 years doesn't want to just stop cold turkey. They want to do something. They want to, they want to make a difference. Um, and everybody has their own areas of interest. Um, you know, I looked at getting into venture or private equity, but I realized all my experiences have been about helping HP go global, grow scale. I didn't have a lot as much to offer to a small company as maybe a larger company. So, uh, but somebody like Meg and Carly, I mean, they're, you know, still very vigorous and very active and want to make a difference, so they chose the political route. Um, I don't think that's a trend. I don't think you're going to see a huge groundswell of that. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's just, uh, you know, two people's answer. Well, Poisoner is the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, their answer to what do I do after I after I step down where I can you know, stay involved. Um, I personally uh, <laughs> give them a lot of credit. I don't know why anybody wants to be governor of California. <laughs> so when Meg uh, told us on the eBay board that she was going to do that, we said, you want to do what? <laughs> but, uh, you know, but I have to applaud her for, uh, you know, she's a great person and, you know, if she can make a difference, uh, that's great. But I, I just think, I don't think you're going to see a huge number of people. I, I think the bigger issue, let me, let me answer it a different way too. I think the bigger issue is there's a whole bunch of other people that are retiring now, what I call baby boomers, that aren't CEOs. They weren't you know, big senior executives in companies. But there's a lot of those people who are still really, really good and very capable. And I think one of the challenges we have is how do we get people like that, because they don't want to just retire either. How do we get them connected to organizations where, where they can make a difference? And there's a new program we're actually funding through the Packard Foundation uh, uh, that's called the Encore Program that, that links executives and nonprofits to give opportunities for them to go and maybe find another career in a nonprofit. So anyway, there's, it's a big issue, but I don't think politics itself is going to be the, the answer for most people. Over here against the wall, we had a question. Speak loud. You, had you had mentioned that one of your concerns is education. Would you please elaborate? Well, I, I just think when you look at um, when you when you look at the the valley, um, so much of it is based on the technical expertise that we have. How many companies came out of Stanford? You know, Sun, Cisco. You know, you, you know, in the early, yeah, Google, early on days, uh, yeah, Yahoo, uh, HP, eBay. eBay. Uh, certainly, certainly, um, you know, Stanford is a huge feeder. Berkeley, other, other, you know, research institutions have been huge feeders uh, for, um, for talent. But, you know, when you look at the graduate programs there, a large percentage of people are foreign born. They can't get visas to stay. And I think that's a huge problem. Uh, I think um, I think the education system. Not everybody's going to get a PhD or a master's from Stanford, but when you look around the valley at all the technology jobs we have, you know, there's the, we need people that have good fundamental 
understanding of science, that are creative, that want to want to um, um, you know apply that creativity and work hard. You know, I had a friend of mine from um, from India come here uh, tell me one day. He says, you know, this is the one place in the world where everybody comes knowing that you can change your life. You can, it can make a big difference if you work hard and you're smart and you know you you have a chance to change your life. And it's it's not it's not easy to do that in in many other parts of the world. And so we need to take advantage of where we are and what we have going and make sure that we have an education system, particularly in sciences and math, which provide not just the PhDs and the, and the, and the, 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 the senior research people, but the people who get the day-to-day -day work done. And, uh, and we, need, we need a, a much uh, bigger uh, group of people and, and, uh, and certainly a competent group of people who can carry forward and keep up with the growth that hopefully we'll have. And, Again, given, given the future of where we are with education and the cutbacks in some of the sciences and math, I don't know if that's a, a slam dunk or not. I think I, I just raise it as a question whether we're going to have the, the capability that we need. Robin. Yeah, you. you talked about some of the WorldCom, the Enrons, the financial crisis. I'm curious in your role as a board member how you see the evolution of the role of the board, the accountability, the fiduciary responsibility, and just kind of the oversight role that it plays evolving and changing given some of the recent activities and just the perception of board and are there shortcomings and how should how should yeah. companies look at that role? Kind of like being governor of California. Yeah. <laughs> why, would, why would you want to do this? <laughs> no, actually, it's, it, that's a really good question. Um, I, I wasn't on a lot of, I wasn't on big company boards in the, in the 80s or early 90s, so I can't compare. But I know, you know, when when John Young retired from HP and some of the other senior executives, they were on eight or nine boards. I can't imagine being on eight or nine boards today. The workload and the other things that you have to do. So it's definitely changed. And I think there was a time where the boards were probably more collegial, more more social in some ways, um, friends of the CEO. But I think nowadays. Um, what the, the shift I've seen, particularly since, um, since Sarbanes-Oxley and the WorldCom Enron, is the boards really do recognize they have a fiduciary responsibility, take it very seriously. Um, you know, you, you have to have people on the board, at least, I think, two or three that have really good financial expertise to be able to do a deep dive and get under the covers and find out what's really going on. Uh, I think you have to make sure that um, uh, that there's an there's an atmosphere in the boardroom where you feel like you're you're getting um, good information from the management team. Uh, I think um, you know a CEO who holds all their cards and isn't very forthcoming, frankly, is probably not going to last very long because nowadays I think boards need that transparency and openness. Um, and the some of the discussions are more heated. They are more um, they are more. Um, uh, tense in terms of is this the right thing for the company? Are we doing the right things for the shareholders, etc.? That said, it's it's really kind of a, a a fine line that you always walk on a board, because at the end of the day, you're also there to advise and consult, uh, and as the management team. So one of my roles, I'm actually lead director at at eBay. So. So I spend time with the CEO, and we talk about business problems, and we talk about some of the challenges. We talk about the board meetings. So you know, there's an additional role, other than kind of your hard hat fiduciary role, of just really helping the company be successful. And so you have to understand that you uh, you need to you need to back off. You need to know when you know when to, to ask the, ask the tough questions and when to be uh, uh, looking at all the uh, fiduciary issues in a very, very comprehensive way, but you also have to be able to, um, you know, roll up your sleeves and problem solve and help, and it's, it's a tough balance. But boards have changed. I mean, there's no question that that's very different. The, the amount of time that all my boards spend on, on governance and fiduciary issues and making sure you get the right board. I mean, I would say a big thing is over the last, you know, seven or eight years, there's been a lot of change where, where you're now getting many more independent directors who come at it with experience like mine or others 
that that you know have run big companies or been CFOs, so they they come at it with with a much better perspective of of the kinds of questions that should be asked. We have a question. Yeah, back at the back. Um, Ned, you mentioned that uh, change management was a critical skill for successful leaders today. Other than living through it, how would you prepare for that inevitability? How would you best prepare for change management? Well, I think it um, kind of goes back to, to something I said. I think, first of all, you have to, you have to accept the fact that uh, during the course of your career, in the course of any business, you're probably going to have to go through several major transitions. And each one of those could be life or death. You know, it could be a life-threatening transition. So, so you have to be prepared for that. And, uh, and then you have to be able to um, recognize, you know, you know, when you get to that point uh, that, you, um, that you have to go down a different path and, and, and act a different way. For me, it's, it's about looking at where you want to be and where you are and looking at um, what are the gaps. And we spent a lot of time in several of my, my jobs at HP and Agilent looking at, uh, we, knew, we knew we had this business and going in this direction, but we needed to be in this business. And then we looked at the skill sets, and we knew the skill sets over here were different than here. We also knew, n knew that all of our, our systems, even, even our compensation system, all of our all of our uh, internal IT processes may not line up with this new business. So once you decide where you need to be, you have to go through a pretty rigorous process to saying, what are the key success factors I need over here? How are they different from where you are? And then you start getting you know, uh, projects in place to take you from A to B. And that's not an easy process. It takes, you know, I think, minimum of three years and probably closer to five. Um, the biggest thing, the hardest thing, though, is the culture change because it usually involves, you know, culture change. Um, I'll share one one story I, I didn't mention in my talk, but um, going through these things is is very difficult on your people. And when we were doing this in in HP in the early '90s, um, and we were trying to get out of the well, not get out, but really de-emphasize the aerospace defense and move much more into kind of the fast-moving um, communications businesses and things. And, um, what I re and it, it required very different skills and processes. And I realized there were three kinds of people. There were people who got it right away. When you said, I need to go to B, they said, OK, I get it. I can go there. And they were running full speed ahead with you. There's a, a second group that keeps their head down and says, this too will pass. You know, I'll just keep my head down and they'll ignore it and this will, they'll have something different in six months. And then the third group never wants to change. And it's almost a third, a third, a third in my experience. And I've been through this a number of times. The mistake I made is I spent all my time for about six months or a year with that last group trying to convince them they were wrong. And I finally gave up on that group, spent all my time with the first group, and lo and behold, I got most of the second group to come along. And many, in fact, most of the last group left. And you have to accept that. There's going to be some fallout. People don't want to change, and they don't want to go in a new direction. But that's, that's life. That's, people are like that. So, so it's a cultural change. You've got to change systems, processes, everything. But it starts with a very, very clear um, articulation of where you're going to go, what's different about where you are today, and what are the steps you have to do to get there. I'm going to let Warren have the last question here before we wrap up. I have one I would like to ask at the end as well. You're going to be the last word. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and then also in, in terms of change, I think the best solution is hire a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know me, I'm a consultant. Um, Ned, I just read in the LA Times this morning that over 40% of the currently unemployed have been unemployed for greater than six months. I think it's the largest since World War II. Um, and in companies, uh, morale is down, fear is up, money's tight across you know personal, professional, everything. Um, yet executives are rich beyond anything we've ever seen. 
both in terms of accumulated wealth and continued bonuses and salaries and packages. How do we reconcile this notion of employee engagement and the trust you said? I think trust was maybe one of your first or second principles of leadership. Number one, uh, how, how do we get people motivated and engaged, ready to walk through fire for their leaders when there's this huge disconnect and, and, and seemingly a lack of trust of, of, of leaders who don't really seem to care or there's so much monetary temptation that they're blinded by the reality of what it takes to run an organization efficiently and effectively? Well, I, I think um, I, I wouldn't put those folks on my list. Um, I, I think there's, um, there is a real disconnect now. And, and um, one of the things that bothers me, it really bothers me as well, because one of the points I made is that people will follow if they believe that your objectives are aligned with theirs and you're not out there just to make money and they're out there working their tail off to build a successful company. That's a real disconnect. And so um, I think there are too many CEOs and senior executives, particularly in the financial industry, who put money first. Um, and, I, um, and I think that's a problem. And, and I, I personally would like to see it reined in. I frankly don't know which comp consultant they use that can justify a $100 million annual salary. I don't see it. I don't see anything close to that. Uh, so personally, um, I think there's a real problem out there. Now, how is it going to get fixed? Um, it doesn't look like the government's going to be able to fix it. <laughs> uh, you know, I thought maybe there would be some success at reigning in Wall Street. A lot of it starts in Wall Street, and it kind of trickles down. Uh, but, I, but I do think that um, it's, it's a problem, and, it, and it, it actually comes back to some extent to business schools and how people are kind of trained it's, it's very interesting. You, you don't see as many of the top people anymore going into running companies and wanting to build something. They want to go manage money or be a hedge fund or, or whatever because it's all about the money. And I don't know where that comes from, but I think it's a problem. We've got to get more people who love to roll up their sleeves, get their hands dirty, and build something. And, um, and I think it starts with some of the, you know, the education and training. I think it starts with you know, maybe the uh, pressure from employees and, and other groups that are, that are saying no. Shareholders, I, hopefully shareholders will start voting the bums out. I mean, if somebody's getting $100 million a year, vote them out. You know, they don't need to be CEO. They can buy, you can get somebody else that will do it. Not, nobody's that good. So I, um, I, I think at some point there's going to be a revolt. I don't know exactly what it, what it will be. But I'm personally um, very much against that whole idea. And I think there ought to be some kind of a, you know, one of the things we always used to look at in HP is the, kind of the ratio between, you know, what a senior leader gets and what's, you know, what the, you know, the person down the organization makes. And you can't, got to keep those uh, ratios in line. And again, one of the problems with the financial industry is not just the CEOs, it's the traders and all these people. So there's hundreds of people that make bonuses that are way out of line. So again, we all give them that because we have stocks and bonds and probably they're taking our commissions and everybody else isn't doing that. But at some point in time, there's got to be a, you know, a, a kind of a revolt to, to turn that around. Let me close with this question on a, kind of a different topic. But you've had such a great career as we've talked about and you've sort of had almost several different evolutions of that, that career. So as you look kind of the next three to five years of your life, what are you looking most forward to in the next phase of your retirement? Well, you know, I don't know what the next phase Our, is. In, in the next <laughs> you know, three five I, years of whatever phase it is. Well, <laughs> I told myself when I, I actually stepped down, I was almost I was 63, almost 64. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, uh, almost, um, you know, four and a half years ago. So I said, well, I'll, I'll do this until maybe I'm 70, mm -hmm. 72 or something, which is coming up a little closer. And, um, and, then, I'll, and then I'll see. You know, but... I can't ever see just kind of cold turkey uh -huh. stop. Um, in fact, I, I was telling somebody the other day, the day I stop learning is the day I start to die. So as long as I'm staying active and doing, hopefully doing something useful, um, then, then you know, I think I will try in some way to do that. I, I enjoy, I've done you know, a little bit of, um, as I said, a little bit of teaching here and there, a little bit of coaching. and. I actually enjoy that, and I enjoy some of the mentoring and things I do on boards. But yeah, I, at some point, I'll probably wind down instead of being on 
four boards, I'll be on two and maybe eventually one, but uh, I'm not ready to play golf every day. Well, we're glad to see that because you're making an important impact and we really appreciate you being with us today and sharing your insights with us. It's been extremely valuable. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you a lot.